Well, good morning or good afternoon, everyone. I guess, I don't know if we've hit the bewitching hour just about. Um, welcome to the first meeting uh, of the Health Policy Commission for the year 2021. I don't know about you, but I was very glad to see 2020 go away. And I'm optimistic that on a lot of fronts, uh, we will have a much better year in uh, 2020. Um, okay, uh, before I begin though, I, I wanna make sure, is, De is Rick um, here, Rick Lord? There you are. Hi, hey, hey, Stuart. My fellow, uh, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't say more than countryman, soldier, <laughs> uh, having been a member of the commission since we were founded eight years ago. And Rick, you've been a, you've been a wonderful, wonderful commissioner. And um, for the rest of the world, uh, I just want to acknowledge that Rick will be um, signing off as a member of the commission. This, But I hope you will come back and visit us either virtually or in person. Um, from time to time, you've been a tremendous asset, and I particularly remember all the work you did on chart uh, and making sure that that program worked well. And you represented the uh, the uh, business community extremely well. But I I, I want to say you took a much broader view about the impact of healthcare on our whole uh, state, if not the country. Rick, would you like to say anything? Uh, sure. Um, well, first of all, Stuart, thank you for those kind words. Um, in a way, it's hard to believe it's been eight years <laughs> that we've served on the HPC together. Um, I have to say I was really honored when Suzanne Bump back in 2012 um, gave me the opportunity to um, have the employer seat on the commission. Um, and it's just been a great experience um, for lots of reasons. Um, you know, we were charged with tackling this really unique challenge of controlling healthcare costs that no other state had really done before. Um, um, Stuart, you've led a wonderful group of commissioners. And I can't say enough about the respect and the collegiality and the dedication of my fellow commissioners. It's just been a pleasure to serve with all of you. Um, and I don't have to tell you how lucky and fortunate we've been to have the first class staff, um, including David and Colleen and Lois and Kate and all the rest. Um, you know, we've just been blessed with such a talented group of individuals that have helped us to fulfill our mission. Um, and so I'm going to miss all of that, honestly. Um, I'm going to miss the commissioners. I'm going to miss all of the staff. Um, and but it's a pleasure to hand it off to Patty Haupt. I've known Patty for several years when she was at the New England Executive Benefits Council, and she's a great successor. I was so happy when Suzanne told me who was going to be taking over the seat. So uh, it's in really good hands. Um, so I wish you all well, Stuart. I'll take you up on your invitation to visit sometimes, maybe I, when we're back in person. <laughs> I, I sure hope you will. And we'll uh, toast, I don't know, a Coke or a glass of wine or something good like that. You think a glass of wine would be a hey, I, I like that <laughs> idea much better. Well, you've introduced our new commissioner, but let me officially do it. Okay, Patty and Holmes. I'm going to sign off. What's that? Yeah, no, okay, well. Thank you, Rick. Take care, Rick, and I'm sure, Thank you, Rick. David, you may want to say the goodbye. All the best, Rick. <clears throat> No, Rick, on, on behalf of all of the staff, uh, thank you so much. And um, it's really just been an honor working with you over the last eight years as a, a member of our inaugural HPC board. Um, I was uh, one quick reflection. Uh, back when we first started, we actually had four policy committees, if you can believe it. And you, Rick, ably chaired our, our cheeky committee. And I would challenge anyone to remember what cheeky actually stood for. <laughs> Uh, community healthcare investment and consumer involvement, um, and an able leader, um, and and really uh, just your legacy will live on at the HPC. So thank you, Rick. Well, that's great. 
I don't know if any other commissioner would like to say anything. If not, Rick, we will, we wish you the best and um, keep it up in the broader world. So let me now uh, officially introduce our newest commissioner, Patricia Hout, who um, had recently retired as the uh, executive director of the New England Employee Benefits Council. And uh, for people that know the employee benefits world and the broader area, uh, Patty is a uh, almost a household, if not a household word. So <laughs> welcome, Patty. And I don't know if you'd like to say uh, any words of welcome as well. Well, Stuart was very kind to spend some time with me the other day as we're calling in David, getting me uh, onboarded and um, oriented and, and Dr. Berwick sent me a nice note. So I feel very welcomed uh, and humbled and excited and really hoping to bring the employee benefits perspective. When I started my job at NEBIC is what we called ourselves uh, eight years ago, a little over eight years ago, one of the first people to reach out to me was Rick Lord. So um, he has been a gentleman and very collaborative and I hope to uh, follow in his footsteps and also be able to um, in the conversation with Stuart the other day, talk about reaching out and engaging the business community a little bit more, uh, develop some really good ties and contacts there, both um, locally as, as well as nationally. So hoping we can capitalize on some of that. Well, again, thank you, Patty. And <laughs> we look forward to working with you closely. Um, and as Rick pointed out, uh, we like to think that, A, we do important work for the Commonwealth uh, but what we do it in a collaborative way. And again, as Rick pointed out, and which I know every day, we have an excellent staff led by our executive director. Uh, so welcome to the, to the club and um, we look forward to working with you. All right, um, our first official activity for uh, 2021 is to approve the minutes from um, November 18th, uh, is there a motion? Now, the way we're gonna operate, um, as we've done in the past, since we are a, a virtual or remote, we need to take the vote of each individual. And as we've done in the past, our deputy executive director, uh, Colleen will read your names and you will indicate uh, whether you support the motion or not. So. First of all, is there a motion to approve the minutes? Move to approve. Okay, second. a second. Okay, are second. there any additions or corrections? Anybody want to make? If not, Colleen, would you please read the roll? I will do so, Stuart. I will ask each commissioner to uh, present to vote and ask that Commissioner Haupt abstain for this first vote. Um, okay, and I will start with uh, Chair Stuart Altman. Uh, approve. Vice Chair Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Berwick. Aye. Commissioner Blakeney. Aye. Commissioner Cutler. Approve. Commissioner Foley. Aye. Commissioner Haupt. Abstain. Thank you. Commissioner Kreider. Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Master Giovanni. Yes. Under Secretary Peters. Aye. And Ms. Roeder. Aye. Thank you. Very Unanimous. good. Um, before I, I'm really looking forward to this meeting. Uh, there have been a number of interesting and important uh, events in the health world um, since our last meeting, including the um, the passage of a, an important piece of health legislation uh, and the signing by the governor and some important changes in the, some of the key actors in our healthcare. So I'm now gonna turn the, the rest of the program uh, and activities over to our executive director, David Seltz, who will both fill us in on these and also introduce the relative staff as we move forward. David, it's yours. Great, uh, thank you, Chair Altman. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good afternoon to the public. Thank you uh, for being with us this afternoon in this 
first meeting of 2021. Uh, as always, for the members of the public, our materials for this meeting are posted on our website, uh, including the new uh, research presentation that we'll be presenting uh, toward the end of today's meeting on uh, persistently high out-of-pocket costs for Massachusetts residents. Um, we'll note, as you said, Stuart, uh, a pretty varied agenda here for discussion. We'll have an update from Beacon Hill, uh, a proposal on revised certification standards for ACOs. Uh, that includes an emphasis on health equity for the first time, a number of updates on healthcare market transactions, and again, that, that research presentation uh, with some new analysis out of the APCD. Um, but first, wanted to give a, just a quick recap of uh, 2020 and the work of the HPC and some recent publications. Uh, Colleen? Great. Thanks so much, David. As the chairman said, and I think I can speak for everyone when I say we were happy to close out 2020 and start a fresh uh, new year here at the HPC. Um, last year, even during the shutdown, the pandemic, having really frank conversations and concrete work planning with our team and our community around issues of systemic racism and, and health equity, um, this was a year where we made a lot of adjustments, but we kept everything going. So as summarized on this slide, some of the agency's key accomplishments, I won't go through our year in review in detail, you're all there, but I do want to highlight two things. Um, one, we did manage to host 17 uh, public meetings with you all, a combination of in-person at the top of the year, and then virtual events in March and thereafter. And we did present over 800 slides. So if you're ever looking for some work that the HPC did and you can't find it in a report or a publication, it, it will be in a slide deck. Um, and then second, I just want to highlight our work maintaining patient rights. Our Office of Patient Protection received over 1,200 calls to the hotline from consumers seeking help navigating health insurance. Even in a remote setting, OPP continues to man the phone lines and provide a lot of help to people who really need it. So um, goodbye 2020, but there is a lot to look forward to in the new year and a new set of goals for us to meet. And you know, on behalf of the staff, uh, I, just, I know that we'll continue to meet and exceed our goals together with our board and all of our stakeholders in, in the healthcare community here in Massachusetts. So. Um, and then just on the next slide here, in December, we did release um, a couple of publications that I'd like to bring to your attention. The first output I wanna highlight is a guide on sustaining grant funded initiatives based on lessons learned from our HCII awardees that successfully sustained their programs. As you all know, sustainability is so important. Um, as a quick reminder, HCII included programs addressing telemedicine for behavioral health, neonatal abstinence syndrome, and pilots to address complex healthcare cost challenges. So this guide includes important considerations for and approaches to sustainability planning, including lessons learned on how to obtain leadership buy-in, ensure the program is aligned with patient needs, and think creatively about funding options. So that's available on our website now. And then second, we're excited to announce our new Healthcare Innovation Spotlight series, through which we plan to feature compelling stories of providers addressing challenges in meeting their patients' needs in really creative ways. So the first in this series is a spotlight on Hebrew Senior Life. Uh, he, he, Hebrew Senior Life, as our board well knows, offers integrated senior living and healthcare services for seniors and is based in Boston. It's been doing it for over 100 years. Um, so this uh, short four-page brief highlights their incredible pivot to care for older adults in residential communities throughout the COVID-19 pandemic. HSL, which is an HBC awardee, looked to components of their HBC funded program that was already in place. It's called Right Care, Right Place, Right Time, the R3 program to inform and broaden the system they put in place to meet the needs of all their residents during the pandemic. So just, just to give a few quick examples from the brief of what they did and what they continue to do. HSL staff established call centers and engaged volunteers uh, and staff to contact every resident on a daily basis. And during those contacts, they posed a standard set of questions to residents and established a system to address needs that arose, even set up on-site grocery stores to rapidly assist people who needed food and other items immediately. HSL leadership also focused on addressing social isolation and supporting residents' mental and cognitive health 
One example of their efforts was offering safe alternatives to in-person congregate programming, which is something they're really known for. And they offered meditation and virtual games over the phone. They delivered weekly printed activity packets to residents, which included trivia, uh, physical exercises, information on radio and TV programs they could tune into, and dementia-friendly uh, brain games. So this is a really short brief. It's only four pages. It's, it's packed with information. So please check that out on our website when you have a chance. We're going to continue to facilitate these pandemic learnings from providers and communities to get them out there into the world. Massachusetts has, has much to learn and share, and, and we at the HBC are in a unique position to facilitate those learnings and getting them out there into the world. So with all of that, I will turn it back to David for the legislative update. Certainly a lot happening on uh, Beacon Hill these days. And so back to you, David. Thank you. Thank you, Colleen. Great, uh, thank you, Colleen. So wanted to provide um, a more robust uh, update for the board on all of the activity on Beacon Hill. And there was uh, been a lot of activity in the last uh, few weeks. Um, so first, just an update on where the legislative uh, process sits right now. So in the early mornings, early hours on, on the morning of Wednesday, January 6th, the legislature closed the 2019 to 2020 uh, session. And only a few hours later, they commenced the new 2021 to 2022 legislative session with the swearing in of members and the election of a speaker and Senate president. Uh, Senate President Karen Spilka was reelected to serve as the Senate president for her second um, full two year session, um, as well as former House Majority Leader Ron Mariano uh, was elected as the new House Speaker uh, following the departure of Speaker Robert DeLeo. Um, and in their um, opening remarks for the new sessions, both leaders uh, mentioned health care. Uh, Senate President Spilka, in her post-election speech, emphasized the need to redouble support for patients and the workforce in all facets of our healthcare system and to strive for racial and health equity. And Speaker Mariano, in his remarks, called for protecting and investing in community hospitals and addressing the rising costs of pharmaceuticals. Um, so we're very excited to work with this leadership team in the new session on those priorities. So right now the new session is underway. Bill filing begins this week and committee and leadership assignments are expected uh, by mid-February or, or perhaps earlier. So this slide um, also summarizes a really important piece of legislation uh, that passed just days before Christmas um, and that was signed by Governor Baker on, uh, I believe, New Year's Day, January 1st, an act promoting a resilient healthcare system that puts patients first. Um, this legislation represents a, a very significant step forward in the Massachusetts healthcare reform journey and um, reflecting lessons learned from the pandemic response includes a number of policies that will better position the state to advance uh, a more resilient, a more innovative, and a more efficient healthcare system for the future. And I want to give uh, special thanks and recognition to the healthcare financing committees and the leaders of the conference committee, Senators uh, Cindy Friedman. Uh, and now Speaker Ron Mariano and their staffs uh, for working until the last possible moment uh, to enact this, this really important bill. Uh, I would also recognize the governor who signed the bill uh, as it also includes a number of reforms um, that have been part of the COVID-19 response that the governor has advanced through uh, executive order and, and codifies uh, many of those policies, particularly around uh, telehealth um, and, and scope of practice. And finally, uh, I think importantly for the board, the, the legislation also includes um, uh, provisions and reforms that have been longstanding recommendations in our annual cost trends report, again, in the areas of, of scope of practice, uh, telehealth and support for community hospitals. So I'll, I'm gonna walk through in a little bit more detail um, some of these, these major provisions um, so first on telehealth, uh, as part of the efforts to expand telehealth access and to codify its expansion uh, during the pandemic, uh, the act um, defines telehealth as the synchronous or asynchronous audio, video, or other telecommunications technology 
uh, including audio only uh, telephonic calls. And it requires the Group Insurance Commission, uh, commercial health plans and mass health to cover telehealth services uh, if they were uh, appropriate for telehealth one and two uh, covered for in-person care. So uh, what we have sometimes called uh, coverage parity. Uh, it also includes a permanent uh, payment rate parity uh, for telebehavioral health services and uh, two years of rate parity for telehealth uh, primary care and chronic disease uh, management services. Uh, and that, that uh, parity may or may not be uh, extended um, in part due to um, some further work that we're charged with in terms of evaluating the impact of telehealth. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, in the scope of practice area, uh, it uh, seeks to expand access to care and really to leverage our incredible uh, workforce, especially our nursing workforce. Uh, it enables nurse practitioners, nurse anesthetists, and psychiatric nurse mental health uh, clinical specialists to practice independently and removes outdated and non-evidence-based uh, scope of practice restrictions. Um, Massachusetts now joins um, m most other states in, in, in adopting this policy. Um, practitioners, of course, still must meet certain educational and, and training standards um, under physician supervision um, for some period of time. Um, it also allows uh, Massachusetts optometrists to treat glycoma uh, and other eye-related infections. And then uh, finally, on, on mass health, um, it does include uh, additional support for community hospitals uh, through kind of a, a monthly mass health enhanced payment. Um, and uh, that will, um, uh, is there's eligibility there to, to target uh, uh, certain community hospitals with, with high need. Um, and then not reflected on the slide, but uh, one that we have also been thinking about is the role of urgent care. Uh, here, it, there's a provision that allows mass health patients to visit urgent care facilities uh, without first having to obtain a, a referral. So on the right-hand side of the slide, um, there are a number of provisions that are very specific to the HPC, and I'll just walk through these and then I'll, I'll pause uh, for some questions. Um, but first is the act uh, actually modifies our board composition to explicitly and to permanently include a registered nurse with expertise in innovative treatments as appointed by auditor uh, Suzanne Bump or as appointed by the auditor. Um, we are, are grateful for Commissioner Blakeney uh, to serve in that role and her continued wisdom uh, and leadership in this board seat, uh, but this will make this uh, a permanent um, part of our board composition uh, moving forward. Uh, the act also directs us to um, assist and to consult uh, the Division of Insurance as they develop uh, telehealth accredi accredi accreditation requirements. Um, and then finally, uh, also includes the HPC on a number of, of new councils and commissions, including a Rare Disease Advisory Council, which will be led by DPH. Um, and in, in kind of a, actually a separate standalone bill, there is a new commission to uh, make recommendations to reduce or eliminate racial inequities in maternal mortality and severe maternal morbidity. Uh, and the HPC also has a role on that uh, com special commission uh, as well. So I will have more to say about some of the, the studies that the HPC has to lead, um, but maybe I'll just uh, pause here for a minute to see if there are any questions or comments. Okay, great. Uh, I'll, I'll keep moving through this. Uh, there's a lot here. So the um, legislation also has uh, two studies that the HPC is charged with really taking a lead on. So the first is on um, the impact of COVID-19 on the healthcare system. And this is a very comprehensive uh, mandate uh, for the HPC to do in collaboration with CHIA to really study uh, a number of different impacts of COVID-19, uh, including uh, impacts on accessibility, the quality and cost of healthcare services, the financial standing of healthcare entities in the short term and long term, and to really think about the implications of COVID-19 on other longer term 
uh, policy considerations. Uh, as part of this study, we're charged with consulting with uh, UHHS, other state agencies, and really the broader um, market, healthcare market, and, and advocacy landscape to really help inform uh, this work. Uh, a lot of dimensions to this. Um, as you know, commissioners, we have been uh, throughout the pandemic uh, presenting at each board meeting on some of the latest data on the impacts of, of COVID-19. So uh, we hope to be able to leverage some of the work uh, that we have already been doing um, to help meet this mandate. But as you can see, we have a short time window for, for an initial part of this report uh, due April 1st, uh, and then a final report due uh, closer to the end of the year. So much more to come on, on this uh, new mandate and this, I think, really uh, important uh, study that will help shape uh, healthcare policy um, in a post, hopefully, a post COVID-19 uh, healthcare landscape. And then on the right-hand part of the slide, uh, the HPC is also leading a study on the impacts of, of telehealth. Um, and here too, we consult with, with Chia and others, and the study will focus on the use of telehealth by patient demographics, geographic data, the type of service, the impact on utilization and on access, on costs and expenditures, on payer coverage um, and payment rates and the appropriate scope of coverage uh, rec requirements for telehealth services. Um, the report uh, does ask the HPC to make recommendations on the appropriate reimbursement rates for telehealth. As I mentioned earlier, the law does include payment parity for uh, primary care and chronic disease management services for a two year period of time. Um, and uh, it is envisioned, I think that this uh, report will help um, inform further legislative efforts on telehealth moving forward, taking all of the best lessons learned uh, that we know of uh, from the COVID-19 experience. So um, that report, uh, we have there a little bit more time, an interim report due one year after the signing of the legislation and a final report uh, two years after. So two, uh, big, two big pieces of work for the, the Health Policy Commission. Um, the legislation also includes some really important provisions around out-of-network billing, which also intersect with new federal legislation on out-of-network billing. And so really wanted to give an update to this board about both of those new advancements um, because out-of-network billing and surprise billing has been such a priority for the Health Policy Commission over the years. So um, for this, I'm gonna turn it over to, to Lois. Great, thank, thank you, David, and um, um, nice to, to see everybody virtually. I'm gonna actually turn um, uh, the baton over to Kate McCann, who is gonna talk about the new out-of-network billing law in Massachusetts and the new federal law. Great, thank you, Lois, and good afternoon, commissioners. Very pleased to be here today to provide summaries of two new out-of-network billing laws. We'll begin with the new Massachusetts state law introduced by Director Seltz, which addresses the three key components of a comprehensive solution to out-of-network billing, which are enumerated on this slide. First, the law includes new disclosure and transparency requirements for providers and insurers designed to prevent certain out-of-network billing scenarios from occurring. Number two, the law prohibits out-of-network providers who fail to provide the required notifications from balance billing patients subject to fines beginning in 2022. Third, with respect to the question of out-of-network provider payment determination, the law requires the Secretary of Health and Human Services in consultation with the HPC, CHIA, and the DOI to develop a report and make recommendations on establishing non-contracted out-of-network commercial rates for both emergency services and non-emergency services no later than September 1st of this year. A non-exhaustive list of the requirements for the report are shown in the last bullet. It includes an assessment of potential rates, the impact of such rates on various factors, and best practices in other states. Next slide, please. There is also a new federal out-of-network billing law, the No Surprises Act, which was signed into law in late December. The law provides a long-awaited federal out-of-network billing solution after several years of attempts. 
Effective in 2022, the law applies to out-of-network emergencies and care delivered by out-of-network providers at in-network facilities. To summarize some of the key provisions, number one, the No Surprises Act includes new disclosure and transparency requirements for providers and insurers. Number two, the law prohibits balance billing and holds patients harmless so that they are not financially responsible for greater cost sharing than they would be had the services been rendered by an in-network provider. To elaborate on the balance billing prohibition for just a moment, providers may not balance bill for emergency services, may not balance bill for non-emergency services rendered by certain provider types, including ERAP providers, neonatologists and assistant surgeons, as well as a few others but providers may balance bill for other non-emergency services if they satisfy the prescribed notice and consent requirements in the law. And third, with respect to out-of-network provider payment, the law outlines payment process requirements and establishes a 30-day period of open negotiation between the parties. The law further establishes an independent dispute resolution process to which the parties may submit if they still can't reach an agreement after negotiating. That process is a binding baseball style arbitration, meaning that each party submits a final offer and the IDR entity selects one of the two final offers, a process designed to incentivize parties to be reasonable in making their final offers. The law categorizes information that the IDR entity must, may, and may not consider in making its determination, some of which is noted here. I'll highlight that the IDR entity must consider the median contracted rate to be defined further, but may not consider usual and customary charges or billed charges, nor can it consider public payer reimbursement rates, including Medicare. The No Surprises Act applies to providers, facilities, and air ambulances. It notably excludes ground ambulances for which an advisory commission is established. And the law applies to both fully insured and self-insured health plans, which is significant because state out-of-network billing laws only apply to fully insured health plans. Finally, the law includes a number of publication and reporting requirements, such as recurring reporting by the Department of Health and Human Services on the IDR process, and a report by the Government Accountability Office on the impact of the surprise billing provisions. So now I will turn the baton back to Lois to discuss the impact of the laws and what's next. Thank you, Kate. And as, as both Kate and, and, and David noted, these are significant developments in an area that the HPC has long tracked. Um, and so, well, what does this mean? What's next? As we've discussed many times in recent years, there's been a lot of legislative activity on out-of-network billing and many states around the country have addressed uh, consumer protections in this area and addressed out-of-network payments in a variety of ways. As Kate noted, the federal law addresses areas that the state laws cannot, namely the self-insured group plans and air ambulances. The federal law notably does not preempt state laws governing out-of-network billing. And so with these sort of dual tracks, I think there are a lot of questions about what that will mean uh, for states moving forward, including Massachusetts. The implementation of the federal law will involve over this next year, extensive rulemaking as the three agencies who are um, mainly implicated, the uh, Department of Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, Department of Treasury will develop uh, regulations on many topics, including the method for determining the medium contracted rate, which as Kate noted is the, is the touchstone in the dispute resolution process, the IDR process itself, and how that process will be accessed by providers and payers across the country. And in Massachusetts, there will be implementation of the new Massachusetts law and the work of the required study regarding the out-of-network payment uh, rate will take place in 2021. Um, and that report will be developed in the context of this federal law and may indeed inform you know, potential legislative action around a, an out-of-network payment rate in Massachusetts. So overall, significant developments with important consumer protections um, and still a lot of implementation questions, but we will continue to watch as implementation unfolds and return to the board with further updates. So happy to, to field uh, questions now before we move on. 
Lois, Lois? Yes. I, I, can you say more, um, particularly on this issue about ambulances? Um, I was struck by the fact that it was left out of the federal law, given how much of the surprise billing or that we saw in ambulance services. And to what extent does the uh, Massachusetts law impact on that or is it silent on it? Give us a little flavor for that. Sure, I, and as, as you may have been following the, the federal debate, but this was a, a, a heavily um, negotiated federal law with, with kind of a, an 11th hour sort of compromise. Um, in the stimulus bill and um, explicitly ground ambulances are excluded and that's left to a, to a commission to, to address only air ambulances, which are governed by the um, Federal Aviation Commission um, are subject to this law. The state law and Kate can correct me, does also does not address ambulances, but it, it uh, applies to other providers, but not ambulances. Um, and, and you're correct that we've seen in the data that, that a lot of out-of-network billing situations do involve ambulances as, of course, um, patients um, aren't able to, to choose in an emergency situation um, a, an in-network ambulance. And so that is an issue that will uh, have to be addressed you know, in continuing legislation. Okay. I don't know, Kate, if you have other, other thoughts on the... Well, no, negotiations. you know, I did see a study which talked about the number of the how, what a small percentage of ambulances are in in-network uh, contracts, which means that I would say the vast majority of patients who have an ambulance come to them uh, are going to be coming, uh, the ambulance is not going to be in the network. So I would think it would be an area that we would want to watch pretty carefully. Yes, and, and Lois, I would just underscore, in addition to everything you said, I think you know, this was a notable exclusion from the federal law and all eyes will be looking to see what the report um, you know, says that comes out of the advisory committee, which is established by the secretaries of labor, health and human services and the treasury. Um, so they, their charge is to issue a report within six months after they first meet, and it includes a number of different things, but um, certainly prioritizes recommendations on um, uh, prevention of balance billing to consumers for, for ground ambulances in out-of-network emergencies. Thank you. All right. Um, and, and Hannah, can you move on to the... Next slide. Sorry, Lois, uh, Commissioner Blakeney has a question for you. Sure. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> Lois, any data telling us what percentage of towns or cities have ambulance contracts? Um, that may well have a huge impact and, and I don't think we know that information. I don't have that, that information um, readily available, but that is something that um, we've looked at a little bit in the past and I'll, I'll, okay. I'll try to find that out for you. Great, thank you. All right, changing, if there are any, uh, no more questions on out-of-network billing, kind of changing um, topics a bit, and I'm gonna update you on yet another new responsibility for the Health Policy Commission in 2021. Um, that was not included in the healthcare bill, but was included in the fiscal year 2021 budget. Um, and that is a requirement that the Health Policy Commission conduct an analysis in consultation with the Board of Registration in Nursing um, and issue a report and recommendations about entry into the nurse licensure compact. So a state entering into the compact means that registered nurses and licensed practical nurses licensed in the home state can practice in other compact states without having to obtain a separate license. And I should point out that under, uh, during the pandemic, under the governor's emergency order, nurses licensed in other states can temporarily practice in Massachusetts. Um, but under the compact, that, would, that mutual licensure um, would be permanent. 
The compact was first implemented in the year 2000 and currently 34 states participate, including two New England states, Maine and New Hampshire. But Massachusetts, there have been many proposals in the past um, and this study would uh, require HPC to look at a number of, of factors about uh, whether Massachusetts should join the compact, including whether the compact could help with emergency preparedness, any impact on quality of care, impact on the ability of nurses to provide telehealth services across state lines, the experience of other states who have joined the compact, and the experience under the governor's emergency order that I mentioned. Based on all of that analysis, the HPC is asked to develop recommendations on the compact and complete its report by June 15th. So that's a relatively quick turnaround in, in the context of a, many other reports that the HPC is working on, but we've already begun to gather academic research and literature. We will be consulting with the Board of Registration and Nurses, and we're gonna be doing outreach to other states to learn from their experience, to inform our report, as well as reaching out to, to experts. And we welcome um, feedback and, and thoughts of, of the commissioners. We had an opportunity to, to speak with Commissioner Blakeney, um, and get her experience, but welcome, welcome your input and thoughts and help on this project. <clears throat> uh, Lois, uh, it's Chris Ryder here. Uh, a, a suggestion on, uh, uh, as the research uh, goes to other states, uh, if, you, if you could ask specifically whether they have um, any, uh, have done any good uh, studies or have good uh, utilization data um, with regard to uh, the difference between acute self-limited illness and chronic illness. Um, I, mean, I think I think I speak for everybody. We welcome the this as a I think a, a benefit for the Commonwealth. Uh, uh, and as you know, as we're undergoing these uh, other studies uh, right now, I think it'd be useful to. To, to, to really get a sense of how much of the uh, uh, of the success in other states is related to <clears throat> self-limited illness or to chronic disease. Thank you, that's helpful. Lois, just uh, for the report, there's actually been a little bit of recent work on travel of nurses during the um, COVID epidemic. Um, and so we ought to be able to learn a little bit from that. I There's a very nice paper that was just written on this that I'll forward you uh, a link to the paper. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, we have our, our nursing expert, David Auerbach, um, who's our, all over the traveler nurses. Got it. So David, I can forward it to you as well. You may, you probably have seen the paper. Thank you. Stuart, I have a question. Um, just out of interest, what is the situation in the Commonwealth right now about physician licensure across state boundaries? Uh, is there been any uh, change in that under the COVID circumstance? Lois, do you know um, uh, around the governor's perhaps executive order in this, this area? I'll need to confirm, but my understanding is that similar to the uh, emergency order with regard to nurse licensure, the same is true for physicians. That, that's correct. Thank, oh, thank, thanks, Lauren. Um, and uh, Commissioner Berwick, uh, we are aware that there is a, a similar type of multi-state um, multi uh, physician licensure compact um, that uh, Massachusetts is, is not a part of, of either. Um, but um, is certainly something that is um, people are, are, are thinking about uh, that as well, given the um, role of the executive order in, in really helping to build up our workforce uh, during the pandemic. Tim, did you have a question or a comment? Yeah, just a general comment. Um, I feel like... <laughs> There's a lot uh, that's being presented here and a lot of uh, studies and timelines, some of them short-term and then longer-term. 
Um, and just, you know, I think it's a testament to the work of the HPC that the legislature keeps asking the HPC to do more and more. Um, I'm wondering if the budget has increased to help support this. Um, like, you know, there are competing uh, time and attention to these types of uh, reports and some of the other work that we had talked about at the beginning of the year that we wanted to focus in on. And so I guess my general comment is, you know, is there things that are going to drop off um, because of the additional uh, studies and reports that the HPC staff needs to undertake? Um, and kind of how do we prioritize the deadlines that are given and the other critical issues that we've been talking about needing to address as a general point. And then just kind of want to remind us as we're going into these studies, the racial justice lens that we've been talking about um, at the HPC and ensuring even if the some places the legislature didn't charge us to add that uh, lens to this work that we uh, we've come up with a, uh, an approach that we want to do that. So I just make sure, and as we're thinking about these studies and reports that we keep that in uh, the front of our minds uh, as we move uh, forward. And uh, clearly we have a lot of thoughts about the nurse compact. So uh, I'm happy to follow up and get our, gather our thoughts to help support um, the report that comes out. Um, I think there's clearly a charged environment on all these issues, this one as well. So I uh, look forward to that by just uh, clearly, uh, the more work that continues to come, I uh, just want to make sure that we're staying focused of adding the racial justice lens to that work and making sure we can still have time and attention to all the other things that we've been talking about doing and how, how does this impact the workload and workflow of the HPC. Uh, thank you, Commissioner Foley, and, and I'll, I'll first uh, reiterate and, and reaffirm our commitment to uh, the health equity and social justice and racism um, lens uh, to the work that we're doing here and, and do think that that um, will be a part of everything that we do uh, this year um, uh, and, and all of our research and programs. And we'll, we'll talk about one of our programs in a minute that where we have uh, tried to uh, implement and, and incorporate uh, health equity principles into it. Um, this is, this is, um, a lot of work. There, there is no doubt about it. Um, this is an ambitious agenda on top of an already ambitious agenda on top of a, a healthcare system that is, um, you know, still very much struggling. A workforce that has been extremely taxed, uh, as you know, and um, our our role is is um, in increasing. Uh, our budget uh, in the uh, was approved at the amount that we had. Uh, requested uh, that request, you know, went in in January of, of, of 2020 and did not does not reflect either the expanded role that we've had in kind of uh, the COVID pandemic response nor uh, these new mandates. So we're going to have to make this work with with what we have. Um, that being said, we were already doing some great work on the impact of COVID-19 on the impact and, and utilization of telehealth. Um, so I think we were well poised uh, on many of these areas to really be able to help and contribute. And we've had a long standing record on, on out of network billing. Uh, you know, this particular study is a, is a little bit of a new area, but we have done some work as you know, on, on nurse workforce issues in the past. So uh, part of our, our, what we're doing right now, uh, commissioners is, is really kind of lining all of these work plans up into a master work plan for the year and, and thinking about the different deadlines. Um, so we'll be back and to you and, and communicate with you around if we see where those trade-offs are and, and what those are and, and discuss them together as a group. Um, but also I think finally would just say, we're gonna need your help commissioners as well on, on all of this. And so um, the, the work extends to you uh, and, and we really would appreciate and, and, and welcome uh, your input and, and feedback on all of these studies where all of you have a, a great deal of expertise to lend. So thank you. Barbara, you have a comment or question? Uh, <clears throat> yes, Stuart, thank you. And, and um, <clears throat> I look forward to helping in any way I can with, with this report. It's the compact has been around, has been noted since 2000. And it's taken many, many years to build to the number of states that are, that are currently involved. Uh, issues have had to be flushed out, and there's complexity here that is not um, quickly uh, to the to the front or to the you know to the casual eye. But I think we can get to a conclusion, and I think that conclusion will be uh, to the benefit of, of the state. It is a short timeline, 
Um, but I have no doubt that the team that the commission is is um, is pulling together is is up to the task. So I look forward to, as I said, providing any assistance that I can. As for the larger question, the larger picture of, of it feels very suddenly that we now have three significant um, new studies in our charge, uh, one of which is on a very short timeline. Um, I, I think as long as we have the resources to do the work, um, I, I welcome the work, but I also want to ensure that the, the, these are not significant add-ons to the staff that are already working very hard. Um, so, so David, whatever help you need in order to ensure that our bandwidth is up to the, up to the challenge, um, I think we would all commit to being there to help you make sure that that's the case. Thank you. That's great. Uh, if we don't have any more questions, I know we have a big agenda, David. Uh, you want to, uh, Lois, either, is there any more in this section or you want to move on? I think, I think we're ready to, to move on, sir. Thank you. That, that was a lot, but there was a, a, lot, of, a lot of new information um, there. Um, and thank you um, for all of the comments and, and support. So the next agenda item, uh, in addition to our uh, new ambitious agenda. We continue to have a number of, of programs and important initiatives that are, are part of our core uh, mandate, uh, including our ACO certification program, uh, which has been a very successful program um, over the years and in really trying to help uh, influence and steer uh, the development of accountable care organizations in Massachusetts and set goals um, for where we hope to see this uh, innovative model of care uh, continue to evolve in a way that's gonna provide the most value to the Commonwealth and, and to the patients that they serve and the communities in which they're located. And so uh, very happy to turn it over to Kelly Hall, our uh, Director of uh, the Healthcare uh, Innovation and Transformation team uh, to present our um, final recommendations around the revised certification standards uh, for this program. We did uh, present this at the committee level um, late last year and got a lot of great positive feedback, uh, but here today to bring it to the full board um, for discussion. Thank you, David, and good afternoon, commissioners. Um, as David indicated, I am here to present to you for a vote um, our final design of ACO Certification 2022, Learning, Equity, and Patient-Centeredness, otherwise known as ACO 22 LEAP. So as you probably recall, and as David alluded to, Chapter 224 charges the HPC with establishing an ACO certification program to promote more integrated care delivery systems in the Commonwealth to achieve cost containment, quality improvement, and patient protection across the board. So the launch of the certification pro uh, program in 2017 made Massachusetts the first state to have statewide all payer standards for ACOs, as well as transparent, publicly available information about how ACOs are structured and operate. So we use these standards to achieve two fairly broad goals. One is to, en to enable transformation of care delivery and to support payment reform. And the second is really to build knowledge and transparency on ACO approaches and to facilitate learning across the delivery system. So to date, we've certified 16 ACOs that collectively represent nearly 3 million Massachusetts residents who are attributed to them. So AC, ACO 2022 LEAP represents the, the latest evolution of our certification standards. So back in 2017, the initial focus of the program was really on recognizing attributes or capabilities of ACOs and creating some kind of baseline for the HPC and the public to understand what these new things were. So for the first two certification cycles, we learned that ACOs vary significantly with really meaningful differences in how they're organized and governed, their operations, their cultures, and their experience and approaches to managing risk contracts. 
So in this, our third ACO application cycle, we will maintain our focus on ACO capacity to improve care delivery and contain costs. That is always bedrock to this program. At the same time, however, we'll recognize structures, processes, and approaches that we believe are likely to facilitate learning and improvement over time. So this focus on learning and improvement um, might sound familiar. It's inspired by the National Academy of Medicine, formerly known as the IOM, and their learning health system vision of a healthcare system de designed specifically to innovate, iterate, and improve care delivery over a period of time. This approach was particularly relevant and valuable in situations like ours in that it accommodates considerable heterogeneity and acknowledges that, at least for now, there isn't a single right way to be an ACO. So the LEAP 2022 framework will provide substantial flexibility to ACOs while maintaining the same rigorous standards that establish a clear vision for delivery system transformation in Massachusetts. So with that sort of high level intro, let me turn the conversation over to my colleague, Mike Stanek, who will review uh, the specific details of the 2022 approach. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm happy to be here today to provide an update on proposed changes to the HBC's Accountable Care Organization Certification Program. As Kelly mentioned, we are calling the updated framework and standards ACO 2022 LEAP, reflecting our focus on learning, equity, and patient-centeredness. The refined standards presented today would be in place for ACO applications submitted in the fall of this year. That is, they will apply to ACO certifications that are effective for 2022 to 2023, since these are two-year certifications. As Kelly mentioned, we believe we can build on the first two certification cycles of this program and evolve our ACO standards to even better advance care delivery transformation in the Commonwealth. When the program standards were first designed, ACOs were still relatively new. We initially focused these payer agnostic standards on core ACO capabilities, including supporting patient-centered care and governance, quality improvement activities, and investments in population health. Now with the experience of two certification cycles under our belt, as we look toward our third cycle for ACOs, we are proposing some changes to the standards. These changes are designed to build on the existing standards while being intentional about where we steer the program going forward. In this work, we were guided by the recognition that we are all still learning. The national evidence on the relationship between ACO capabilities and outcomes is still developing, but ACOs do seem to perform better on cost and quality metrics with time and experience. We believe that fostering effective learning and feedback mechanisms can be an important component of care delivery transformation. Given the range of experimentation and learning ACOs are engaged in, we would like to provide flexibility to the ACOs in recognition of the fact that there may be different ways to demonstrate how the ACO meets the spirit and the letter of our standards. The updated standards are intended to allow for a variety of ACO approaches and innovations within the framework we set forth. With respect to the emphasis of the ACO LEAP standards, we propose to build on the existing standards to ensure ACOs are positioned to learn from and iterate on their activities. As Kelly mentioned, thus far, we focused on recognizing definitional attributes or capabilities of the ACOs and creating a baseline understanding of them. In our proposed standards, we purposefully embrace the ACO model as a catalyst for learning and improvement among healthcare organizations. And in this, we were influenced by the National Academy of Medicine's vision of a learning health system, which they've described as, quote, one in which science, informatics, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement and innovation with best practices seamlessly embedded in the care process, patients and families active participants in all elements, and new knowledge captured as an integral byproduct of the care experience. The key elements of the learning health system concept dovetail with what the HBC's investments and policy recommendations seek to achieve, including things like real-time access to knowledge, engaged patients, incentives aligned for value, and performance transparency. The updated criteria we will walk through shortly intentionally seek to incorporate these elements. And finally, as ACOs continue to transform care delivery, we are excited about the role ACOs can play in advancing health equity in the Commonwealth. As we will discuss, our revised standards layer an additional requirement that ACOs be engaged in intentional activities to promote health equity. Next slide, please. In the fall, we released our proposed updated standards for public comment. We just wanna pause here to thank all the organizations that took the time to provide feedback during a challenging period. 
themes. We heard some key themes, the most notable of which was a request that we be mindful of the timing of our application process and the administrative burden, given the uncertainty still associated with COVID-19. And as we will touch on at the end of the presentation, we intend to build additional flexibility into our application timeline this year in response to this feedback. We also received some targeted feedback about the criteria and associated requirements. This feedback was helpful and will inform how we communicate our expectations when we issue our more detailed application requirements document in the spring. Next slide, please. This is, in short, the proposed structure and contents of the ACO certification application. If you recall previous ACO applications, this structure will be familiar to you. As in the past, we will collect certain background or prerequisite information from ACOs. This year, that will focus on governance, risk contracting, and attestations of legal compliance. The evaluative portion of the application centers on the five assessment criteria. The overall number of criteria will not change from prior certification cycles, and the topics covered are not all that different from previous topics we have addressed in certification. For example, patient-centeredness and population health management have been core components of our standards since their inception. But we've taken a fresh approach this year, both to take advantage of what we've learned so far and to incorporate learning health system principles. We will include in this assessment criteria section a health equity requirement. It won't be a separate assessment criterion, but rather it is an expectation that one of the ACO's responses to any one of the five assessment criteria will demonstrate an intentional activity to promote health equity. We'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Finally, from the outset of the program, ACOs have been required to provide supplemental information as part of their application. That practice will continue in the applications later this year with a focus on the topic areas listed here. We generally use the SI questions as an opportunity to gather structured data. That information is important both for shedding light on ACO innovations and practices and for informing future modifications to the certification standards. As always, we will be mindful of limiting any administrative burden associated with responding to these questions. And as a reminder, with limited exceptions, the information collected by the HBC through this application process is held confidential. The HBC will not disclose at the individual ACO level without the consent of the ACO, non-public information and documents submitted for certification that are clinical, financial, strategic, or operational in nature. However, we may discuss and report on certified ACOs using aggregate or non-attributed information. Next slide, please. So now we'll do a slightly deeper dive on each of the five assessment criteria, since these are the standards to which the, H the ACOs will be held. Here and in the next few slides, we are showing you the language of the standard. In our more detailed application requirements, we will have guidance for the ACOs on how exactly they can show us that they meet the standard. We did sketch out those proposed documentation options in our request for public comments, but we are not showing that level of detail for the purposes of the vote today. The first criterion here builds on the patient-centeredness components of our existing standards while widening the scope of ACO activities that demonstrate patient-centeredness. Here we would be looking for a demonstration of activities the ACO uses to monitor and assess patient experiences or perspectives. That could include intentional use of patient experience surveys or systematic use of patient and family advisory councils to gather insights. We'll further ask for a demonstration of how the information collected is used to inform strategy in the ACO. And this could be shown through things like written plans or a description of a recent initiative to improve an aspect of the patient experience. To reduce administrative burden where possible and appropriate throughout the application, we plan to encourage applicants to submit existing documentation the ACO may maintain for its own purposes rather than produce new materials for the application. Next slide, please. The second proposed criterion recognizes the importance of culture to ACO performance. And in keeping with our theme, we focus on the ACO fostering culture of continuous improvement, innovation, and learning. We contemplate a variety of different ways an ACO may be fostering such a culture, including sponsoring ACO citizenship activities among participating providers, involving the ACO's leadership in quality monitoring and improvement activities, leveraging internal financial incentives, or use of metric-based approaches to selecting clinical or non-clinical partners. ACOs would be asked to demonstrate two approaches. Next slide, please. Having contemplated the leadership role in driving an ACO-wide culture of performance improvement, here we turn to ways the ACO supports frontline clinicians to decrease unwarranted variations in care delivery and increase adherence to evidence-based guidelines. 
this criterion focuses on the ACO commitment to using the best available data and evidence to guide and support improved clinical decision making. ACOs will, will be asked to demonstrate that they have adopted processes or tools that make available reliable current clinical knowledge at the point of care. They could show this through a description of an initiative to reduce low value care, or an example of an evidence-based protocol or structured learning opportunity made available to ACO providers. ACOs will also be asked to demonstrate that they offer actionable data to providers through things like performance feedback reports or data analytics support. Next slide, please. This next criterion is very similar to an existing assessment criterion. It requires that the ACO develop, implement, and refine programs and care delivery innovations to coordinate care, manage health conditions, and improve the health of its patient population. Here we are looking to see some documentation of how the ACO stratifies or screens its patients to understand their need for population health management programs. And then we are looking to collect some semi-structured information via completion of a template document about the programs themselves, with a particular emphasis on the priorities, goals, and performance targets the ACO uses to assess and refine those programs over time. Next slide, please. Finally, this criterion encourages the delivery of integrated care that seeks to address patients' behavioral and social as well as medical needs. In particular, it requires that ACOs seek to integrate behavioral health and connections to health-related social supports into their care delivery models. Here we would be looking for information on the milestones and implementation goals the ACO is holding itself to in developing or pursuing a behavioral health integration strategy. Or if there is no ACO-wide strategy, we would be looking for documentation of an advanced integration initiative or pilot within the ACO. Similarly, we would be collecting information on the incorporation of screening and referral processes for health-related social needs in the care delivery. Next slide, please. I want to turn now to the role that health equity plays in the ACO certification standards. Given the HBC's health equity action plan and our goals with this certification program, we've given thought as to how best to embed health equity principles into the program. We had sought some public input on focusing on ACO capacity for race or ethnicity data collection or stratification, but the comments we received convinced us to rethink our approach a bit as data collection capacity continues to evolve. Instead, we plan to focus on concrete actions that ACOs are undertaking to improve health equity. We did not want to formulate the health equity aspect of the standards as a wholly separate work stream or requirement. Rather, we view the improvement of health equity as a goal and an approach that is complementary to the framework we laid out in five criteria, and one which can and should be embedded into any and all of the core ACO capabilities and functions that we seek to recognize in the assessment criteria. So we are proposing that in responding to any one of the assessment criteria, the ACOs highlight an intentional activity or initiative to improve health equity. In essence, we are asking that one of the ACOs assessment criteria responses to be chosen by the ACO be health equity themed. We will require that in the response to that particular assessment criterion, the ACO provides certain additional pieces of information about the activity, the issue being addressed, the data or information the ACO used to identify the problem initially, and some description of what the activity is and what it aims to achieve. We will also collect some additional structured data on ACO priorities and activities to promote health equity in the supplemental information section of the application. Next slide, please. Finally, you can see here our timeline for the certification cycle. We plan to release more detailed application requirements in the spring, at which point we will work with the ACOs to ensure they understand the standards and are prepared to apply in the fall. In the past, we have used October, October 1st as our application deadline, but due to the possibility of lingering COVID-19 related impacts on ACO operations, this year we will offer a rolling application deadline instead. ACOs will be able to submit their applications anytime between October 1st and the end of the calendar year. We believe this provides needed flexibility to the ACOs as they navigate competing demands during what we hope is the waning period of pandemic response. With that, I'm happy to take any questions you may have, commissioners. All right, Mike, hi, this is Stuart Altman. Um, <clears throat> thank you, uh, you and Kelly, thank you very much. And let me first say that I'm uh, very much in favor of the proposed additions, but I need to ask you some questions. <clears throat> um, it's good that we're discussing ACO certification again. Um, this is an area that the commission has uh, been involved in almost from the beginning. 
Um, and I, I, uh, so I, I wanna bring everyone up to date. One of the key issues in our certification was where we would sit vis-a-vis -vis national standards and um, how much out front we should be. On the one hand, uh, there was some support, if not a lot of support for making Massachusetts a kind of a, a really a bellwether and move pretty aggressively, substantially ahead of most of the other states. On the other, we got uh, both a lot of pushback, but also my own feeling, as well as other commissioners, that we didn't want to get too far ahead because our delivery systems uh, really couldn't deal with it. So with that as a background, can you fill us in on whether this, these types of uh, additions to our standards, um, how much, how does it compare to, with what's going on in the rest of the country and with, our, with the national uh, commission that focuses on standards for ACOs? I sure, know. so I think these standards would put us a little bit ahead of much of the country, just in terms of thinking of what Medicare has done with respect to ACOs. Um, but they're in line, I think, with national standards. That's, that's why we were, in part, why we were influenced by the um, Institute of Medicine or the National Academy of Medicine and thinking about uh, what kind of capabilities we'd be looking for in provider organizations and thinking about where we want to steer the program in the future. Um, and so one of the things that we were very interested in when we went to the stakeholder engagement phase of this process was getting a sense from the ACOs as to whether this is too far up front or if this is something that kind of aligns with where they are and where they're going. And the general res response that we received was very positive in terms of alignment of what we're laying out here with um, ACOs as they are today and as they hope to be in the future. Well, I, I do believe um, given where we have made a commitment to move forward in inclusiveness and in making sure that our delivery system is uh, more focused on populations that have been uh, perhaps poorly served. Again, I, I I'm really strongly in favor of it. So I'm, I just need to put it into some context. Uh, I know Don, you have a question or a comment. So why don't you jump in? Thank you, Stuart. And thank you, Mike. Um, first of all, I, I'm really pleased with this. The, I, I love that you've learned from the experience to date. I think the modifications make a lot of sense. I think the alignment with the National, with the National Academy of Medicine Learning Organization is, is terrific. And I continue to feel that attention to reducing burden is a very important thing to do. And it sounds like you've done that quite properly. Right. I have a question about um, confidentiality. Um, on the one hand, I completely understand why it may be important and necessary to uh, promise the ACOs that proprietary information won't be shared. I get that. On the other hand, we have a real potential here for a statewide learning system because at the, at the more granular level, what they're doing in response to these standards or how they respond to your queries about the uh, five uh, components of uh, performance, that's, that's potentially knowledge that would be very useful. And, I, and I, I'm glad that you're considering aggregating it in a blinded fashion, but I can't help wondering whether there's a way to invite the ACO community to be unblinded about this or perhaps through some volunteer subset, that is ACOs that want their identity protected be protected, but those that don't would then become part of a much more robust exchange of how they're approaching these very difficult tasks. So I just want to put, put a vote in, uh, a word in for unblinding the data we're getting with the assent of the ACOs, if that could possibly be, be arranged. Interesting. I think we need to look at that. Um, I think it's a great idea and uh, is consistent with how we've been operating. So uh, Kelly and Mike and uh, Lois and whoever, I think we should look hard about how much in front we get and whether we look into using us as a demonstration. Tim, you wanted to add some comments? Yeah, just a quick comment, a couple 
quick, quick questions as well. Um, agree with what's been stated around the great work and learning from the experience we've had and applying that to the process going forward. Um, and uh, the recognition of, that Stuart raised about not wanting to be too far ahead, but be ahead and not add additional burdens on folks for the certification process, but learn and grow and adapt. Um, and I'm wondering um, with the conversations with the National Commission on the ACO standards or whatever the title of the organization is, are they contemplating uh, a health equity lens in uh, the national standards? And if not, how can we push that standard as a commission uh, for the national standards is one overall question. And then can you remind me what the next steps of our process are? I know that we finalized certification now. Um, is there another role for the HPC beyond the certification? I'm trying to remember if we actually vote to certify all of them. Just if you can refresh me in the next part of that process, particularly wanted to see, as you said, uh, stated around the health equity that um, the ACO will pick a couple of things and report back. It'd be good to see what that looks like, um, that area in particular, because of its newness. Um, I know there are other pieces as well, but that's a whole new uh, criteria to see how that works and what kind of ideas they're coming forward with that they believe uh, deals in a, uh, with the issues of health uh, equity. So in terms of the process, uh, if the vote is successful today, we'd move forward with the more kind of detailed development of a an application requirements document for the ACOs. Um, and then we'd spend a good portion of the year just making sure that they're comfortable with those, are uh, familiar with them and are ready to apply in the fall. And then um, following the application process at the end of this year, we would next year, I think we'll be able to start sifting through what we learned through that process uh, and think about how to proceed. Uh, in response to your first question, the, the National Academy of Medicine framework that we have in mind isn't isn't exactly a set of ACO standards per se. It's more of a, a vision for how the health system in general will, will kind of evolve. And so um, what we're doing is a little bit more, I think, granular in terms of, um, you know, looking for ways that, that ACOs can fit into that framework and can demonstrate that they're moving in that direction. And so we've, we've deviated a little bit from that. This isn't... Um, no, no, Mike, Mike, it's the, the uh, IOM is not what we're talking about. We're talking about the accrediting agency yeah. nationally and how Tim's question is the same as mine. You know, we've Around had this relationship it. with them. Sometimes we've gone with them. Sometimes we've paid them to help us. Where are we with that and how much ahead of that group? That's what we're talking about, not IOM, much and as CQA. I love IOM. Gotcha. So uh, NCQA, I believe, is no longer issuing ACO certification standards. They've kind of reverted back to a PCM, PCMH. Well, that's standard. interesting. Yes. So in this cycle, we, we really weren't able to draw from, from that. Is there any <laughs> other organization that's in the business, or we is each state now totally on its own? Uh, I think states are generally on their own. There's only a few states that are actually issuing ACO certification standards. Um, Vermont comes to mind, although they only have one ACO. But um, yeah, there's not really a national set of standards. So we're not point. involved with them at all anymore? No. Uh, not at this time. Uh, Stuart, there is, as you know, a National Association of ACOs, which has a foundation. Yes, I'm very well aware of them, but I don't think they're in a, I, at least I don't remember them having an accrediting unit, but I'm, what I'm saying is that they, I'm on the board of their foundation. They set up a nonprofit foundation, which may have this under advisement. We could we could inquire about that. Well, we may want to check into that a little bit, Don. But, All right, um, Marty. I know yeah. you've got a... Thanks, Stuart. Um, so having been uh, part of the um, <clears throat> commission when this was first rolled out, I think this is the really the next evolution of, uh, of the standards. So happy to see that, happy to see the focus on uh, health equity. I, I just have a few uh, sort of questions. First, um, do we expect the volume of requests to be the same? Going back to Tim's question about workload, I, I know this is required for the mass health ACOs. Um, do we expect that number to change is, uh, or is it gonna be constant? And then, my second point is now that we've got some history uh, with these ACOs in their operations, are we including the feedback from the payer, in this case, Mass Health, as we develop these standards to make sure that uh, their needs are also being reflected in the standard development? 
Sure. So in response to the second question first, uh, we have consulted with MassHealth. We've, we've walked them through our framework uh, last year, and they were very supportive of the direction we're going. I think it aligns with their thinking as well. Um, well, I know MassHealth has made it a requirement, but I, would, I don't want to lose sight of the private payers as well. The hope was that we would get them involved too. So if we get any comments from them, um, are we working at all with the private payers? Uh, at this at this time, no, we didn't receive any comments from the pub, the private payers in the public comment process. You would agree, Marty, wouldn't you, that we also want the private payers into this if we can? Yeah, I know it's voluntary now, but the hope is that they would uh, accept these standards as important to- I know, and they've been reluctant to do it. Right. All right, I didn't mean to interrupt too much, but um, David Cutler. Yeah, thank you, uh, Stuart. So I, I, I am confused about what's going on. So is it the case that the world is moving away from certifying ACO. Yeah, that came as a surprise to me too. And that it has the world sort of given up on the idea that we should do ACO certification. And so we're now like, you know, in a free for all about this or, you know, cause I'm worried because, you know, this year has been so difficult for everybody that if all of a sudden they're now doing something new that they haven't thought they had to do, is this the right year to do that? And so on. And now, and now you're saying, well, actually the world is sort of not even doing this at all. So I'm, I don't know what to ask. It's just, I'm very confused. Let, let me let me jump in here. I would say there continues to be a lot of tremendous support for the Massachusetts having an ACO certification program from uh, all stakeholders. And and really um, this is this is an evolution of, of something that ACOs have, have already been doing. And we, we really did take their feedback into account. As you might imagine, there are, there are other stakeholders who would like this program to even go further in some of the requirements. And so, you know, part of our process was really kind of creating that right balance between, um, you know, kind of pushing and, uh, you know, also recognizing where people are. And, and I think we've uh, really tried to, to kind of thread that needle. I think Professor Cutler to the question about the NCQA ACO certification program, um, I, will, I will speak uh, I will choose my words carefully here, but that was a very prescriptive certification program, not unlike the PCMH model of, of certifying, which required a lot of documents, uh, raw documents to be submitted, uh, a scoring mechanism. And when we were first developing our standards, we did look at those. And I think the responding response, you know, response from our community was, we still have some learning to do about what, you know, what activities provide the most value and don't be too prescriptive in saying exactly what we should do, but maybe some of the capabilities about how we're doing things would be more appropriate. And so that's really the reflection that we've, we've continued to build into this program. I think Stuart, you, you remember from the very beginning a yes. concern that we would be overly prescriptive and go beyond what the evidence necessarily uh, indicates uh, in terms of requiring ACOs to, to do very prescriptive things. And we, we continue to give a lot of flexibility so that ACOs can kind of, um, uh, recognizing the kind of variation of where ACOs are. I, I, my recollection is that the NCQA ACO certification program did not receive uh, very much in terms of uh, market interest. And so that is why they um, uh, maybe, I, again, I, I, I don't want to speak for NCQA here, but um, uh, they did discontinue that program. So my comment uh, is like David's, um, but I can understand, see NCQA, it looks primarily heavily at the private insurers and private insurers have been reluctant to get into this and, but we work pretty closely. Sometimes we were ahead of NCQA, then we were behind them, then we, we, we contracted with them, but we haven't talked about this as a commission uh, for a while. So that's why I asked the questions I did. Yeah. Um, 
Don, maybe you have some uh, further information that can help us. I, I, I have a clear crystal ball, which is as cloudy as anyone's, but I, I think um, you're going to see a resurgence of interest in ACOs. I think um, things have quieted down on the alternative payments front during COVID because we just had to get money out as a country to these very stressed providers. But we do know that in the COVID pandemic, uh, uh, provider groups that have been under alternative payment models like ACOs have fared better financially than those which were trapped in a fee-for-service model. So that's increased interest in alternative payment. In addition, uh, we have evidence now from uh, 10 years of alternative payment models under the ACA about which of the models look like they're paying off. And the answer is ACOs are, nobody's paying off handsomely, but ACOs look like among the more promising forms of alternative payment, uh, especially physician-led ACOs. So I, I actually think Mike and his team are skating where the puck's going to go. And I think that, um, that uh, th th this will be a pretty, well, we'll be glad we did this. That, that's, that's my prediction. I think um, we probably won't see a tremendous amount of new uh, policy around alternative payment until COVID's quieted down a little light. But I think, I think we're getting ready for where payment go, may go, Stuart. Well, uh, Don, I, I think this is consistent. Um, uh, recognizing Tim Foley's concern about how we spend our time. Uh, David, I hope we uh, continue to focus on alternative payment systems and ACOs. Um, I, am, I, 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 I tend to agree with Don, we're likely to see renewed interest with the new administration in terms of alternative payment systems. So I would hope that you would keep it on if not the top of your agenda item, this issue and come back to us from time to time to have a discussion about alternative payment systems and ACOs. All right, let me- uh, I, uh, I, Stuart. Uh, yeah, I know Chris, I wanted to yeah. give you the last word. Okay, thanks. Uh, just a, a question really for Kelly and Mike. Uh, it'd be helpful uh, to me and I think <clears throat> to the commission to uh, just level set the, um, the growth of ACOs for us in Massachusetts, um, how many uh, there are, how many patients are in each and how much they've grown or not grown over the last uh, couple of years or since formation. Um, because uh, I, I do think, I, I do think there's gonna be uh, more activity, but I might be wrong. They might be flat. Some of them might be going negative. So if you could give us a summary of uh, of who they are, how many we, how many we have enrolled uh, in ACOs today, um, and some uh, sense of how much risk they are taking, um, whether it's uh, limited um, downside risk only, or whether they are moving to uh, more and more uh, risk. And I should also note that uh, at least in other states, um, some of these ACOs have, um, uh, have, have started to move in pretty significantly into Medicare uh, Advantage plans and, uh, and even within that, um, this new designation by CMS for a DCE status, direct con contracting entity for uh, traditional Medicare patients. So there's, I, I, I just love to get a sense of how much growth we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna be seeing uh, potentially. Yeah, we so Chris, do. This is exactly what I'm talking about. So I want to devote a future meeting to this discussion. I have the benefit of having at Brandeis, the research director of the ACO Association, Rob Mechanic. So I've been watching it. So um, David, can you put that in your agenda for future meetings? Uh, absolutely. And, and part of the great um, part of this program is that we can actually answer a lot of those uh, questions, Dr. Kreider, including uh, patients under risk, whether they're upside or downside, how many patients, you know, where they're located. We have uh, all of that and can compile that uh, together. Kelly, I think, can give you a high level. Of, I think there's 17 but, but ACOs. I want to make sure that this does not just only focus on Massachusetts, because my sense was, well, it's more than my sense, that CMS was getting very aggressive on downside risks and in the future was going to demand them. Kelly, I didn't mean to interrupt yeah. you. No, no, it's, it's quite all right. So what I was going to respond similarly to David, which is, you know, some of the questions, Commissioner Kreider, that you posed, you know, 
are reflected in data we routinely collect and include in our ACO profiles. So kind of putting together a trend document or some, some highlights is, is something we can certainly do quite easily. You know, Mike and, and others do do a pretty good job of keeping on, um, keeping on top of what's happening nationally and some of the national trends. And it would not be particularly difficult to, to sort of overlay that perspective on what we're doing here. Uh, thank, uh, thank you, Kelly. That, that'd be, that's great. And uh, Stuart, I agree. If we can have some dedicated time on this, would be useful. And if, oh, absolutely. If, if you can give us in advance the uh, of that meeting, you know, some of these uh, some of these numbers, Kelly and Mike, I think it would really uh, really help us out. Well, um, I'm mindful that we have far exceeded what uh, the small amount of time that David allocated to this. But once you open up the whole ACO discussion, you can't expect this commission not to have a lot of issues and questions. So I, I view it in a positive way, but we do need to take a vote um, uh, on uh, the movement forward of the commission for the new uh, uh, provisions in of ACO accreditation. So unless there's any other burning questions, we're gonna push this forward into the future and. Colleen, if you'd be good enough to take us through. Um, I, there's, uh, I need a motion to approve these uh, recommendations. I'll move, so, so move, Stuart. Second. 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 Okay, Colleen. Okay, we'll start with you, Mr. Chairman. I strongly support them. Thank you very much. Vice Chair Cohen. Aye. Commissioner Berwick. Aye. Commissioner Blakeney? Aye. Commissioner Cutler? Aye. Commissioner Foley? Aye. Commissioner Haupt? Sorry, I was muted, aye. <laughs> Thank you. Commissioner Kreider? Yeah. Thank you. Commissioner Master Giovanni? Yes. Under Secretary Peters? Aye. And Ms. Roeder? Aye. Thank you. Okay, um, all right, David, I'm gonna turn it back to you and I'm, I'm not sorry that we're over the time. It was too good a discussion. No, it was a great discussion, a lot of questions and, and we'll, we'll be back with some more dedicated time on that topic, um, but thank you for, for helping us move that forward. Um, so uh, a lot left on the agenda, but I think there's some important things that we wanna be able to discuss. Um, so um, we may have to, unfortunately, uh, hold on the, the research presentation. Um, we could maybe move that to uh, an upcoming committee meeting. But some of these market transactions are, are meaningful and important. I wanna make sure that we have uh, time for, for that discussion. So um, I think I'm gonna turn it over to Kate Mills to um, give us some of the recent changes and then also talk uh, in more depth about Harvard Pilgrim and Tufts and, and really do um, encourage commissioners to, to um, ask questions throughout and, and you know, provide comments and, and discussion um, on these important market changes. Great. Thank you so much, David, and good afternoon, commissioners. Um, if we could just start on the next slide, which is our standard slide, breaking down the types of transactions that have been noticed to and reviewed by the HPC. So since 2013, when we started noticing uh, transactions started being noticed to us, uh, we've received notice of 118 provider transactions with formations of contracting entities uh, continuing to be the most frequent, followed by physician alignments and changes in hospital affiliations and then clinical affiliations. Um, on the next slide, uh, you'll see that uh, since our uh, last meeting, we uh, have one new notice currently under review, uh, the proposed acquisition of Harrington Healthcare System, including both Harrington Memorial Hospital with its two campuses and its affiliated multi-specialty physician group by UMass Memorial Healthcare. Um, Harrington's hospital and providers currently participate in the UMass Medicare ACO and Harrington's physician hospital organization participates in many of the UMass commercial contracts already. On the next slide, uh, you'll see that we have also elected not to proceed to a cost of market impact review for four transactions. First, a proposed joint venture between Bay State Medical Center and Kindred Healthcare 
to acquire real estate and own and operate a behavioral health hospital in Holyoke to be licensed by the Department of Mental Health. Following the creation of the new facility, Bay State expects to close inpatient psychiatric units at its uh, community hospitals. However, the new facility is expected to result in a net increase in behavioral health capacity, including child and adolescent beds for which demand is high. Um, and the parties are working with DMH to ensure that their plans meet the regional needs. Um, Bay State's plans to remove psychiatric services will also be, uh, uh, from its community hospitals, will also be subject to the essential services review process by the Department of Public Health. Uh, so we expect to continue to monitor any access implications from this transaction as it proceeds through both that DMH and that DPH um, process, but did elect to close our review here at the HPC. The second review that we've now closed was the proposal by Lawrence General Hospital to form its own integrated delivery network, Lawrence Integrated Health Provider Network, or LIHPN. Um, it will uh, contract with payers on behalf of Lawrence General and its affiliated providers. Um, as you know, these providers currently contract through Choice Plus IPA, which had an affiliation with uh, the Beth Israel Deaconess Care Organization, BIDCO, uh, which was terminated at the end of 2020. Um, in our preliminary examination, we found limited scope for spending increases due to the transaction. Uh, Lawrence General and its physicians leaving BIDCO will overall decrease BILH's market share and market concentration. And Lawrence General's prices are currently low relative to other hospitals. Uh, and any success by LIHPN in uh, its goal of retaining more local care may actually reduce overall spending. Um, however, as we discussed a little bit in our last board meeting, the transaction does have certain implications for BILH. Uh, the departure of Lawrence General from the BIDCO network changes the overall mix of patients served by that system and ends some of the merger commitments made by Beth Israel Leahy Health to the Office of the Attorney General and the Department of Public Health. Uh, that were specific to Lawrence General as a safety net affiliate. Um, as you know, we are continuing to monitor BILH's performance and compliance with its commitments, along with our colleagues at the Attorney General's Office and the Department of Public Health, and we'll factor in the, department, uh, the departure of Lawrence General from the Big Code Network into that ongoing monitoring work. Third, uh, we reviewed a proposed affiliation between Bay State Medical Practices, the owned physician organization of Bay State Health, and Valley Medical Group, a multi-specialty medical group of over 100 clinicians in Western Massachusetts. Uh, Bay State and BMG both currently contract with payers through the BayCare Health Partners Network. Uh, and under the proposed affiliation, BMG would lease its practice locations and non-clinical staff to Bay State, and the parties would establish joint management and clinical oversight committees. Uh, BMG would assign its professional revenue to Bay State and would receive lease payments from Bay State. Uh, BMG previously established a similar lease arrangement in 2015 with Health New England, which, as you know, is affiliated with Bay State, and the new lease arrangement replaces that arrangement. <laughs> Finally, Wait, does, we excuse me. Oh, yes. Does that mean that Valley will no longer um, be um, able to contract independently from a uh, base state? Or currently, Valley largely uh, participates in contracts through the BayCare network already. Um, this is really changing the relationship that they had, which was a lease arrangement with um, uh, HNE to now be um, Bay State medical practices. And so it, it's changing that lease, lease arrangement, but not really uh, substantially changing the contracting relationships that it already had in place. So it, can Valley Medical Group contract outside of, of Bay State or are they, are they joined for contracting purposes as a, a clinically integrated network? So it does not change their current contracting relationship with BayCare in any way. And so um, they already have an affiliation with BayCare in which they participate in most of BayCare's um, uh, contracts. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm sorry, Kate, is, is it yeah. an exclusive affiliation with Bay State? So they do establish some contracts on their own. Okay, that's good, thanks. Um, Kate, while, and, while, we, yes. while we have you pause, there was another question from Commissioner Blakeney. Oh, yes. 
Um, thanks, Kate. Going back to the Bay State and Kindred um, program, do you happen to know um, the number of beds that this is going to entail? And specifically, do you know the number of, of adolescent or um, uh, beds that this might involve? Um, yes. So um, uh, I believe that the uh, materials that parties have put forth publicly uh, list a figure of 120 beds okay. um, at this new hospital. That said, we understand that uh, they are in ongoing discussions with VMH. So I want to acknowledge that that number is not final. Okay. Thank you. Kate, before, uh, if I can interrupt also, uh, back to the Lawrence General, uh, I, I'm not quite clear on this. So there was a set of understandings of the Attorney General on proceeding with the BL, with the um, Beth Israel-Lehi merger. Um, and that involved things like Medicaid coverage, supports to the community hospitals and so on. And now with their exit, uh, you, I think I heard you say you're gonna to continue to monitor what happens, but could you get a little, just one level deeper? Like, what are we what, what are we gonna watch for? And could the commission hear back about this at this future meeting? Like, has, has, has the agreement, is it still in force? Is anything threatened about what our understandings were? Um, so nothing about the agreement um, changes. And so the way that the um, assurance of discontinuance with the attorney general's office was written, it actually had specific provisions in place um, if safety net affiliates were to leave. Um, and so the primary thing that changes is that there were specific funding commitments uh, that were made as part of that arrangement to the safety net affiliates. Um, and uh, those terminate upon, uh, upon Lawrence General leaving the Big Co network. Um, but the funding doesn't terminate. It just gets redistributed to the remaining safety net affiliates. Without, um creating too, too much work, I hope. Is it possible for us at a future meeting to take to take a, a look at that for 10 minutes, just exactly how that funding went and what happened? I, ju I just would appreciate the chance to look look at it closely. Sure, and I, I'll you. note that we also plan to uh, continue looking at um, the ILH over time. And so, as I noted, this will change the overall patient population being served by um, the BILH system. And so we would expect to be reporting back to the commission on that as well. Terrific. Thank you, Kate. Any other questions? Hey, you want to move on to uh, the Harvard Pilgrim or unless there's anything else you... Um, Sure. So I just wanted to quickly uh, say on the last transaction here, uh, the proposed acquisition of Community Visiting Nurse Agency, Community VNA, uh, is a VNA based in Attleboro that provides home health, hospice, and related services. It's being acquired by Hope Health, which is a Rhode Island-based nonprofit system that ho owns home health and hospice care providers in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, there too, we elected not to proceed to a cost effective impact review. Um, but we can go ahead with that. Uh, to uh, discussing um, Harvard Pilgrim and Tufts, unless there are any other questions about uh, notices of material change. Before, before we moved on, uh, Dr. Kreider, I don't know if you had uh, any questions about perhaps some other upcoming transactions that you wanted to, to raise at this time. Uh, yeah, thanks, David. Uh, I, I thought we should uh, bookmark um, um, an early look <clears throat> or ask the staff to um, get engaged on the uh, uh, proposed uh, transaction uh, between uh, Atreus and uh, Optum. Uh, uh, I think the Boston Business Journal, it was it yesterday, David, uh, announced the, uh, that uh, the talks are, uh, talks are proceeding and uh, uh, it's of, uh, I think of, of really, really remarkable uh, and a very significant uh, potential impact because there are, I don't know, 500 or 700 physicians. Um, uh, uh, it is the largest independent uh, physician group, um, and uh, a you know vertical integration with a payer through a payer subsidiary of Op uh, of United Healthcare uh, creates. Um, potentially an opportunity to see uh, a competition like we haven't seen before uh, uh, in a uh, market that is dominated by the uh, not-for-profit uh, insurers. So uh, there's a lot 
there, and um, uh, I leave it to the to the staff to to uh, uh, to d determine uh, what the right uh, timing is. But I, I think Stuart, it, it's a it's a it's a really significant transaction, and I hope that uh, it falls under the uh, uh, auspices of the HPC to uh, uh, look at it. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I don't know where that what the uh, uh, <laughs> sequence is with regard to the attorney general's uh, look at a not-for-profit uh, assets uh, and uh, the charitable uh, uh, implications uh, of that, or whether it's AG uh, plus HPC uh, simultaneously, I, I, I just don't know. So I, I just wanted to raise it as a, um, well, let me, I think uh, an important uh, uh, opportunity for the HPC to uh, get engaged. I couldn't agree more with you, Chris, and it was just announced, even though some of us know, have known about it for a while. Um, I think the staff needs to do a significant amount of background work, uh, but it definitely needs to rise to the top of the list uh, of our activities going forward. Uh, and uh, so I won't take any more time today but uh, your comments are well taken, Chris, and, and I'm sure David Sells agrees with us. We are in, in full agreement. Um, we haven't received the official notice yet. I don't think there has been a definitive agreement reached yet, um, but we are um, doing, our, doing our homework in the background, uh, anticipating uh, that filing uh, sometime soon and have uh, been in communication with the Attorney General's office to understand their timelines for review as well so that we're uh, synced up and, and coordinating um, uh, appropriately. All right, now, Kate, I'm gonna turn it back to you. Uh, be mindful of the time, but we also need to be mindful of the importance even though we are not a direct player. So try to give us all we need to know in a way that only you can do. So go ahead. Great. Uh, so I will seek to go pretty quickly um, uh, to update you on this major transaction, which, as you know, did not go through the HPC's review process. We can, yeah, we can go through all this. But. Great. Um, and so um, on January 1st of this year, as I'm sure uh, most of you know, Tufts Health Plan and Harvard Pilgrim Healthcare, the second and third largest payers in Massachusetts, officially merged. Uh, you see listed here on this slide the stated goals of that transaction. They hope to capitalize on the strengths of each of their organizations to improve the affordability of their products. They seek to increase access across diverse products and ge geography, including for underserved populations. They seek to improve quality and they hope to streamline the customer experience. Um, as I mentioned on the next slide, you'll see that uh, this didn't go through an HPC review since it didn't involve providers, but it did go through many different um, uh, uh, other uh, review processes. So uh, the Massachusetts Attorney General's Office reviewed it both under antitrust and charities law. Other state attorneys general uh, reviewed it uh, for the other states in which the parties operate. The US Department of Justice conducted a review and the Massachusetts Division of Insurance. Uh, so this slide lays out a timeline of those reviews. Uh, you see that the Division of Insurance DOI uh, was the final review of the transaction and it approved the transaction on December 24th, which allowed them to culminate it on uh, January 1st. Now I'll note that much of these reviews uh, were confidential um, and the Massachusetts Attorney General and the Department of Justice closed their investigations without action. Um, but as a result of the investigations in New Hampshire, uh, Tufts did sell its New Hampshire business Tufts Health Freedom Plan to United Healthcare. Um, and the Massachusetts Division of Insurance did conduct a public hearing and publicly issued a decision letter uh, and the analysis by its working group was public. So I'll summarize uh, those findings. Um, we don't need to go through the next couple slides in depth. They're just some background uh, uh, stats on the two parties. Um, as you know, Tufts is the second largest payer in Massachusetts based in Watertown, had about 5.7 billion in revenue in fiscal year 2019. And although it has business in other New England states, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Hampshire, 94% of its covered lives are here in Massachusetts. 
Um, I'll note that Tufts acquired Network Health in 2011, uh, which ultimately became uh, Tufts Public Plans. Uh, and as a result, it offers plans across a number of different markets uh, with commercial insurance products, as well as Medicare Advantage and Medicaid MCO products. Uh, and it's a mass health ACO partner to several large uh, provider groups. On the next slide, you see a brief summary of Harvard Pilgrim, which is the third largest payer in the state by enrollment um, based in Wellesley with approximately 3.1 billion in revenue in fiscal year 2019. Uh, like Tufts, Harvard Pilgrim operates in several New England states, but 71% of its covered lives are here in Massachusetts. And while Harvard Pilgrim does offer Medicare Advantage individual non-special needs plans, its focus is really the commercial market and specifically the commercial large group market. It does not offer Medicare Advantage group plans or a Medicaid MCL. In terms of what the transaction itself does um, on the next slide, uh, the parties have really um, been careful to always describe the transaction as a merger of equals. Uh, Tufts Health Plan renamed itself uh, to be Health Plan Holdings back in October and uh, became the parent organization of Tufts Commercial and uh, the public plan wings of that organization, as well as the parent of Harvard Pilgrim um, in Jan on January 1st. Uh, now the board of this new organization, Health Plan Holdings, includes 50% representation from Tufts and 50% from Harvard Pilgrim. And for a while, a lot of the decisions uh, will actually require a 75% vote of the board. On the next slide, you'll see that in the short term, the parties really aren't proposing changing much of what they do. Uh, they expect to largely continue offering health plans throughout the regions where they currently operate and they don't plan to consolidate or moder modify product offerings or their provider networks in the short term. Uh, they've also expressed that they will continue to participate in government and subsidized programs. Now, we do expect to see changes over time as they more closely uh, integrate their organizations, but the parties have noted that any system uh, migration or integration that could impact product offerings or services will be undertaken only after significant and thorough planning to avoid any disruption to constituents and is not planned uh, to occur immediately post-close. Um, on the next slide, you see a brief summary of the party's claims um, around projected efficiencies and their improvement plans. Uh, so the parties claim that they will achieve savings in excess, uh, well in excess of $100 million annually through integrating their organizations. They also state that they'll pass on a significant portion of those savings as premium savings for consumers, as well as um, by using those savings to fund investments that improve quality access and customer experience. Um, including by investing in programs that improve behavioral health access and help address racial disparities. On the next slide, uh, you see a very brief summary of uh, the outcome of the investigations. Uh, as I said previously, the DOJ and the Attorney General's Office in Massachusetts closed without action, but Tufts uh, did sell its New Hampshire business. Uh, the Division of Insurance's review was focused really on its statutory factors, which are relatively broad and comprehensive, and they did a, they did a pretty detailed review, uh, which focused on a number of different things, including the competence of the merged organization, the financial stability of the merged organization, and whether there could be any harm to the health insurance buying public or enrollees. Um, that included a determination of whether the merger would, quote unquote, substantially lessen competition in the insurance market, or tend to create a monopoly. Um, to assist in that review, the Division of Insurance convened a working group, which included um, uh, independent economic advisors, as well as information technology advisors uh, from KPMG. Uh, and you see summarized here the key findings from that working group uh, uh, on the slide in, in blue. Um, Specifically, the working group found that much of the impact of the transaction will really turn on the behavior of the merged company, as well as, as its competitors. Uh, and they found that while the merger will increase concentration in most insurance in markets in Massachusetts, it's not very likely to increase prices, uh, but that there is an opportunity to improve operational efficiency and innovation. They also found that achieving the projected efficiencies is highly in, highly dependent on the integration of complex IT systems. And that while the plans are relatively advanced, the Division of Insurance should closely monitor the progress on those efforts. 
Finally, the working group recommended that the division conduct ongoing monitoring of the party's strategic initiatives, integration efforts, financial reporting, and enterprise risk management uh, through its normal regulatory oversight. Ultimately, the DOI approved the merger largely based on that report, as well as uh, other testimony at its public hearing, which included testimony by the parties, as well as a letter from the Attorney General's Office of Healthcare um, and the Charities Division, which laid out um, some expectations that they have for the merged entity. Um, uh, for example, uh, they expect that the merged entity will, among other things, maintain its charitable mission and its commitment to improving the health of diverse populations, uh, the, part, the populations that it currently serves, including those public payer patients, and that the parties will work to achieve their outlined efficiencies and reduce administrative complexity, as well as ensure that those efficiencies are passed along to premium payers. My final slide, uh, the next one, um, just uh, states that, you know, recognizing that this will be a major change to the market dynamics in Massachusetts, the HPC agrees that it will be um, critical uh, to monitor the impact of this transaction on healthcare cost quality and access. Um, so we expect to monitor this uh, through our ongoing roles monitoring the healthcare market, including through things like um, cost trends and performance improvement plan, uh, the performance improvement plan review process, as well as through focused research efforts. Um, specifically, many of the potential benefits of the transaction to members and premium payers really turn on the parties truly integrating their operations to achieve efficiencies and to provide administrative simplification. But even if those efficiencies are achieved, it will be critical to ensure that they actually translate into savings for ratepayers. Um, we also believe it will be critical to monitor the merger's impact on healthcare market functioning. Um, it will, of course, be important to monitor prices and premiums going forward. Um, but even if, the, as uh, the Division of Insurance's working group found is likely, even if the merger doesn't increase prices or premiums, it could have other effects on market functioning. For example, the merged entity will have more negotiating leverage with providers, given its increased size and presence across many different insurance markets. Um, that could have implications for provider price variation, even if it doesn't increase overall spending, which will be important for us to monitor. Um, finally, like the Attorney General's Office, we believe that it is critical to ensure that the merged entity maintains its commitment to both its public payer members and its commercial members, and that it seeks to improve quality and access across its entire diverse membership. Um, and with that, I'd like to um, open it up to the commissioners uh, for your thoughts on the transaction and um, any other key things that you think that we should uh, be monitoring as this merger moves forward. Let me just emphasize what Kate said. Um, even though we did not have direct legal responsibility for approving this merger, it is a very important uh, change in our healthcare system. Uh, and we do plan, as the last slide indicated, for the commission, the staff to focus on uh, what impact it has on prices that uh, uh, people pay for their insurance, both in the uh, public market, but also more importantly in the commercial market, and what impact it has on total medical expenditures. And we do have authority through our PIP uh, or, uh, to review to what extent uh, the, uh, the new entity uh, adheres to the benchmark. So for the, for the other, for the commissioners and for the staff, I want to make it very clear, we are not just going to let this go without continuing to monitor its activities. Um, with that said, are there any questions or comments by commissioners? I want to thank you, Kate. Uh, Ron, would you like to say something? Yes, thank you. When I look at all these transactions you know, over time, it's really concerning uh, to look at the potential impact, especially when you look at uh, payers acquiring providers. And I wonder what the overall impact of that is. I know that some states like Pennsylvania uh, have gone through that process. What has been the impact in Pennsylvania, for example, at UPMC? where they're both uh, the uh, payer and provider. 
And uh, what type of impact do all of these things combined have on us in terms of quality and pricing? To me, it's concerning. Very good question. Um, I hate to keep doing this, but um, these are important issues that we can't completely discuss today. So maybe, um, I don't know, David, whether you or Kate want us to answer specifically, but I do think we need to discuss this in more depth at some future time. It's, it's a great point, Commissioner Master Giovanni. And I think while we tend to look at these things as individual transactions, I think you're right to uh, uh, ask the question of what is the cumulative effect of all of this. Um, and we, we have some put some work into thinking about that uh, already. And so could come prepared at a future meeting to kind of, kind of maybe take a step back and look at the, the whole bigger picture here. Uh, David, can I make a recommendation that we think about in the, uh, the cost trends discussion, uh, we uh, put aside some time to take a, a, an overview look at the marketplace mm -hmm. and have specific comments maybe by outside experts or inside uh, Massachusetts experts. Sounds good. I think there was another hand raised. Yeah, David Cutler. Um, so thanks. I I agree that um, it, the HPC ought not to be monitoring in the sense that we have oversight because we don't have oversight over it, but monitoring in the sense that this is going to tell us a lot about the healthcare system and that's information we need to know. And I wonder um, whether at the next uh, moat committee meeting we should start to look both at what we want to monitor here, but also come back to any of the reports on the BI Leahy and see where those are. And so we can talk at that committee about how to set up a regular, I'll call it a learning um, exercise where we, can, where we can learn about what's going on and understand it more. David, if you did that, taking Ron's uh, idea which I think is a, an amazing perception to like, how would we know what's happening in the overall market, not just transaction by transaction is a great topic. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Um, I think we um, have our marching orders going forward. Um, so David, we, oh, well, let's see. Um, you wanna give us a, where we're, how we're heading? Well, well, thank you, commissioners. This was a really great meeting with a lot of, of discussion and a lot of work ahead of us. This is gonna be a, a very, very busy year. Um, we have our, our, our scheduled agenda um, here in terms of the calendar, given all of these important topics, uh, we may have to talk about uh, adding some additional meetings to make sure that we're covering all of the important topics uh, raised here. So uh, we will be uh, asking more of you at the same time and, and truly look forward to a really good year, uh, 2021, finally. Okay, so uh, just to remind everyone, our next uh, meeting is uh, gonna be on April 14th, is that correct? Um, uh, Stuart, we, we are likely to have a meeting in between uh, that time period. Um, yeah, good. After, I was um, going to suggest that. Yeah, so uh, that will be that will be coming shortly. We're just uh, confirming confirming a date. So, uh, commissioners and the public should expect that we'll have uh, another um, uh, another meeting before then. But the committee meetings uh, will be on on uh, beginning of February as well. And the uh, you've now set a date for the. Uh, Cost trends hearing? We have not. So that that is uh, connected to um, what we're, we're hoping to, to The confirm. benchmark hearings, I meant. Uh, the benchmark hearing, yes. So that, that would be, um, uh, we're looking at March 25th uh, for the benchmark hearing. Uh, this is our, our annual hearing with our, our partners in the legislature around setting the benchmark um, and uh, also uh, taking some public testimony. So um, more, more to, to come, watch the space in terms of that final announcement, but uh, uh, we will have something in, in March for sure. Okay, any final words from any of the commissioners? Before? 
David, from you, is there anything else? Uh, Stuart, uh, Chris, Chris, man. Uh, yeah. One uh, thing that I, I guess, uh, consistent with the expanding uh, time, uh, either through an additional meeting or expanded time in the committee meetings, uh, learning about these uh, new studies that um, we're undertaking. And I think I saw uh, April 1st uh, as the as the first or preliminary uh, 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 preliminary study for both the uh, the financial health of uh, entities and for uh, the telemedicine uh, uh, impact. So, um, <clears throat> but you know that's just that that is so important. I, I just think we ought to dedicate uh, some time, uh, some additional time to uh, help the staff uh, guide, help guide the staff uh, uh, in, the, in those, uh, in, in that reporting process. Okay. But did I hear right, David, April 1st for a preliminary report on, a, on, a, uh, on the financial health of healthcare entities? Yeah, April 1st is, is the first part of the report on the uh, impact of COVID-19. We do have a little bit more time on the on the telehealth piece uh, in particular, but yeah, these are coming, uh, gonna be coming fast and furious. And we we are we are open to adding more time, uh, uh, you know, in these meetings and the committee meetings to make sure that um, we're, we're really, you know, having the robust conversations and discussions we need and, and so really I, welcome the help, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, I don't want to, I don't want to belabor it, but, but as part of that, um, the, the uh, relative health, um, uh, also includes um, what the insurance rates are for uh, uh, 2021. I, I haven't seen them um, yet, um, and I'm I know I'm sure they're out there, but uh, because of the uh, decreased utilization in Q2 and increased uh, in in Q3, uh, uh, I I just I think we need to know what the what the rates that are. Are being promulgated are to to the public, uh, to employers, and to uh, uh, and, and to all the plans. So if, if you can include that as part of the uh, 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 of the educational update for us um, in um, understanding the financial health of of the uh, of all the entities, it's pretty broad. But good luck. All right. Um... Thank you, uh, Chris. Any other last minute uh, comments? Okay, not hearing anything, I can uh, officially accept the motion to adjourn. I, I've heard a loud scream about it. So uh, we are officially adjourned. Thank you all. And again, thank you, David and the staff. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a lot of interesting stuff and I'm sorry we didn't get to that uh, meeting uh, research group. I would have loved to hear it, but hopefully we'll get to the benefit of their thoughts at a future meeting.